Please welcome John Clark. Thank you, Keith. No problem. Let me get, if you could finish my one, that'd be fast. And how does this, is it, is it a point? Yeah, yeah uh, a pointer is there. Yeah. Right. That's the right hand button. Gosh, all this modern technology to get used to. <laughs> Very interesting to hear Juliet's comment towards the end of her talk when she said that she wasn't a hardcore birder. <laughs> um, this, I suppose you could say that this book that I've written is for hardcore birders because it's all about rarities that have been found in Hampshire. But in actual fact, um, I think one of the things about it is it showcases a lot of the work done by photographers. There's some fantastic photographs in it. It also showcases Dan Powell's uh, wonderful ability to design a book and to include a lot of his uh, illustrations. And also, it, it's, not just, it's not just a book that lists um, all of these records. It's got a lot of stories, anecdotes, uh, about the, and uh, also about the history of birds in Hampshire, and I think there's a lot that uh, people who don't classify themselves as hardcore birders will find interesting. So I do hope that uh, if you haven't already purchased the book, you will uh, consider doing that. And um, I will be with Dan in the second, I think it's called Number Two Exhibition Hall, where we've got copies of the book, and. Um, there's also copies of the book available on the host stall as well. Uh, and obviously we'd be very happy to chat to you more about the book because I'm going to give you a condensed version of the talk uh, that I normally do. Anyway, let's move on. Here's the cover. Um, I expect you all know what most of these birds are, but um, I'm just going to... There we go. So going across the top, we've got red-breasted goose, which turns up with Brent geese... Uh, pretty frequently. Okay. And you can look at the snap. More technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's there, that's nice. Simon, you are? Good. One of the interesting things about the red-breasted goose is that um, the first few records of red-breasted goose in Hampshire were all in the Avon Valley with white-fronted geese. And of course now we've virtually lost the white-fronted geese. It's the same flock that, that goes to Slimbridge and they've virtually lost them as well. And um, so the recent records of red-breasted geese have been with, with Brents. Um, hidden in there somewhere is quite a, you might almost call it an infamous uh, Hampshire rarity. That was the Scops owl that was at Dummer back in 1980. Um, and this, quite a few stories about that one. It was said that the, the landlord of the pub in Dummer did very well because uh, the bird was there for about six weeks and loads of people came, came to see it. Um, penduline tit. Uh, this is the, a, a fairly poor picture of a Franklin's gull, but it's a historic picture because it was taken in 1970 at Farlington Marshes and it was the first ever in Europe. It's a, it's a North American species, of course. Um, this is quite an interesting photograph. For those who didn't see the bird, it's probably quite a hard ID, actually, because it's rather an unusual pose for a Wilson's phalarope. And this, this was a bird that was at uh, Pennington uh, three years ago, I think, maybe four now. Time moves on quickly. And lots of people got to see it. Waxwing, down in the bottom left-hand corner there, it just about qualifies as a rare bird. I'll tell you my definition of a rare bird in a minute, but um, they don't turn up every year, so that more or less makes it a rare bird. And then we've got uh, a woodchat shrike there on the spine, and in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a, a short-toed eagle, picture taken by Alan Lewis, who uh, made a, a big contribution also to the photographs in this book. Um, interestingly, 
I think there's about 185 species out of 370 on the Hampshire list that are mentioned in the book. And something like 80 of them out of that 185 have only occurred once, which is quite amazing, really. Uh, and I've missed quite a few of them as well. <laughs> right, so the book goes right back to the earliest period I can trace information for. A great source of information is Kelsall and Munn's Birds of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, which was published in 1905. There was a, a whole raft of avifaunas for counties around Britain that came out around that time. And they basically collected information about birds that had been collected, stuffed, and, and, and were in various museums and private collections. Of course, Kelsall and Munn also had an even earlier pioneer to draw upon because Hampshire was the home of Gilbert White who uh, lived at Selborne in the, in the late 18th century and he was arguably the first, um, well, arguably the first bird watcher in Britain in a way and a lot of his sightings um, are included in the book. That's our, the first evidence we have that certain species occurred in Hampshire. So I'm going to mention briefly two people from Victorian times that were very influential. This is a picture from Keyhaven. Uh, I seem to recall it was from something like 1838. And um, it's a lithograph. And Keyhaven was a place haunted by Colonel Peter Hawker, who was um, a punt gunner. And he collected, he shot everything he could, basically. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think it was in around that time, in the late 1830s, he was very pleased that he managed to shoot, uh, I think, I, I can't remember the exact number, 20 hooper swans. Um, the weather, the winters were much colder uh, that in Victorian times, and so those birds that have now become so scarce due to short stopping um, were turning up in much greater numbers. This is a picture of um, Edward Hart. Edward Hart lived in Christchurch, which, of course, was part of Hampshire in those days. Um, and he assembled with, uh, with his, his friends and colleagues a great collection of stuffed birds, uh, many of which um, are still, still can be seen today um, because he, he had this, this collection called the Hart Collection, and um, it's now partly in Hampshire at the Chilcombe House Museum. It's also partly in Leicester Museum. And a very large proportion of it is in a museum in London called the Horniman Museum, which is one that I really recommend you go to if you, if you have the time. Um, of course, a lot of heart specimens were, were taken in what is now in the Christchurch area, which is now Dorset, they're mentioned in the back of the book um, because they're not really proper Hampshire birds nowadays, unfortunately, <laughs> because, because of the administrators. Um, but uh, he also collected quite a lot of birds in the New Forest and areas like that. And here's just a few samples from birds of this time that have not been recorded in Hampshire again. So here's a, a cream-coloured courser that was found by a shepherd in Sopley in the Avon Valley uh, in the 1830s, I think it was. That's in Winchester now. And here's an American bitten. And you can see these taxidermists, they, they made a really great effort to not only preserve the birds and make the birds look lifelike, but they also tried to create the background. Um, and this is, this is at Keyhaven. And it, I think it looks... Quite like, quite like Keyhaven, with the Isle of Wight in the background there. And this is one that I always like to tell a, a, a story about. Um, I don't know if any of you know what, what this bird is, but the big clue is, is if you can, somebody said it, yeah, the needle-tailed swift. Now this, this bird was obtained by a, a chap called George Corbin, and he was a cabinet maker who lived in Ringwood. And again, he had lots of local, uh, local friends who um, brought him specimens. And 
Two of these swifts were seen flying up and down the River Avon, and they managed to, to catch one. And um, as you can see, it uh, didn't come into the possession of Hart. Corbyn kept it for himself. He wasn't somebody who was, um, you know, trying to make a name for himself particularly, because at that time there was a lot of, a lot of fraud went on with, with bird specimens. Um, some of you, most of you will have heard of the infamous Hastings rarities. Um, well, in fact, um, Hart from Christchurch knew Bristow from Hastings, so it does make you wonder about some of the things. But George Corbyn um, wasn't in contact with these things. He exhibited this specimen at the Zoological Society in London in 1880. He kept it, and when he died, he bequeathed it to the British Museum, which is where it is now. So I have no doubt that that's a genuine sighting. And it was the second ever in Britain, and we haven't had one since. It would certainly bring all the hardcore birders out if we had one of these <laughs> flying around over Hampshire today. So let's move on to more modern times, um, and I want to just share with you three people who I think had a very great influence on modern Hampshire ornithology. This is Doc Suffern, who bird watched at Titchfield Haven, and he was instrumental in putting Titchfield Haven on the map as an important reserve, and of course it led in the early 70s to Hampshire County Council taking it over as a nature reserve and appointing Barry Duffin as its warden. This is, this is Dave Billett. Dave Billett was one of the first bird watchers at Farlington Marshes and in fact uh, he was just a teenager when he started birding, bird watching there in the late 1940s, early 50s and he with a group of friends including Colin Tubbs um, got together and created this group called the Portsmouth Group, although they, they didn't think of the name, somebody else called them the Portsmouth Group, but they actually started doing counts of the waders and the wildfowl in Langston Harbour, and it is really, this is the, the prelude to all the wildfowl counts and the webs counts that we know today. They set um, an example which has been followed, so, so that's really important. And of course I also include Colin as well, because he, he was a great a conserver in Hampshire as well. You'll know his work for the Nature Conservancy and he was instrumental in supporting a lot of the good work that's, that's gone on in the county. Anyway, what's my criteria to get in this book? So very quickly, one considered by the Rarities Committee of British Birds, one which has occurred in Hampshire on fewer than 200 occasions. There are a few birds that aren't national rarities, but they're still rare in Hampshire. And one which has not occurred annually in Hampshire in the 21st century. So that captures birds like waxwings, which aren't annual. They only turn up when we have big invasions. Uh, and it also covers birds that we've lost. So birds like surl buntings and red shrikes, which used to breed in Hampshire, they don't turn up anymore. In fact, there hasn't been a soil bunting for a long time. So they, they get into the book as well. I've also included birds that were once rare but are now common. So, for example, you get the little egret, the great white egret, and the red kite. I had three circling over my garden yesterday. Uh, so they've certainly no longer considered a rare bird. So here's a first example of some of Dan's artwork. Some bee eaters. Um, and... Beaters. I'm just going to show you a couple of graphs here. This shows 1950 up to the present day, and you can see that beaters are getting a bit commoner. They're turning up a bit more. Could be to do with climate warming. Certainly, there's been a few more breeding attempts in Britain in recent years, although we haven't had any in Hampshire yet. And that graph shows you their occurrence through the year from April through to October, most in the spring, a few in autumn, what, July, August, and one very late chappy turned up in October. So the commoner, the commoner rarer birds, like the hoopoos and the bee-eaters um, and the little orcs and things like that, they have graphs in the book, um, but let's go on to some of the, the rarer ones. So I'm going to run through these. Here's a lesser scorp, which turned up at Blashford Lakes. Um, 
Interesting anecdote with this one. Uh, I mentioned Alan Lewis earlier. He, he uh, was aware, as a lot of us were, that there was um, a lesser scorp in Dorset, um, and it disappeared. And Alan thought, ah, that could turn up in Hampshire and be our first for Hampshire. And he popped down to Blashford Lakes, and sure enough, he found it, uh, and people were able to go and see it. <laughs> now this one, this is a very interesting one, because this one's got a big connection with the HOS AGM. And I wonder if anybody can tell me what that is. Uh, I think it was back in 2004, we were sat down at King Alfred's College at the, uh, the AGM, and news came through that there was an Alpine Swift flying over the river in Winchester. And you have never seen... <laughs> The AGM empty out so quickly. You laughed before I told you. <laughs> so we all went off and saw the Alpine Swift and, and, then, and then came back. And of course there's been, a, there's been a massive invasion of Alpine Swifts into Britain in the last few days. Although I don't think, uh, there may have been one in Hampshire, Keith? One yeah. In one in Portsmouth. Okay, yeah. One at, oh, one at Blatt, that's two then, yeah. <laughs> Here is... Um, a pallid swift, and of course, this is a fairly recent record. I think this was 2020, and this brings into focus the way that uh, finding rare birds has changed quite a bit. Because here we have um, a young guy, um, Frano, with a camera who's able to get a shot of a pallid swift in flight. Pallid swifts, very hard ID, very difficult to, to convince rarities committees that you've really seen one. But when you get a photo like that, uh, it's pretty convincing. Here's a couple of bits of um, Dan's artwork. This was a little swift that was down in the New Forest. I think it was in the year 2000. He had quite a bumper year in 2000, as you'll see in, see in a while. Um, but uh, no photographs of this, I'm afraid. But uh, the story of its discovery is there. So moving on, here's another bird from 2000. This was a greater spotted cuckoo, another one that's only turned up once. This was, this was found down at Key Haven, um, and it was found by a guy called Glyn Horacek Davis, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, he wasn't quite sure what, he, what it was to start with, but he eventually identified it, put the news out, and what, did the, what happened? The twitches turned up and the bird disappeared. Um, but, uh, and it disappeared for about a week, but I have to say it was down to Keith uh, a week later. I think he did a little bit of surreptitious playback, uh, in actual fact. And this cuckoo popped up again, and it, it popped up, as I say, a week later, and it hung around for a, about another week, wasn't it, Keith, I think? Yeah. So that was um, a good sighting. There's one of Dan's pictures. Um, and there is a photograph of it. I think that shows you also, that's the best photograph we could find of, of it. The, pho the photographs have moved on a bit now with the, all the new cameras that are available. So this is a story <laughs> I always like to tell. This is a Bion's Crake. And um, some of you, a lot of you will know um, Eddie Wiseman, who was the warden down at um, Keyhaven Marshes and also my predecessor as county recorder. Um, I think it was his wife was looking out of the window of their farmhouse and she, she said, Arthur's got a bird. <laughs> and um, Ed looked out of the window and he said, he said, it's a crake. And he rushed out there and rescued this Bion's crake from the, uh, from the Arthur the cat. And, um, <laughs> oh, sorry, did I forget to say cat? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. And they rescued this bird and uh, it, it was released, I think it was ringed and it was released unharmed and uh, that's the only one that's ever been in Hampshire, so uh, not one that too many of us have seen. I thought I'd include this picture, um, black wing stilts are becoming more frequent, in fact this was the pair that was down at, again at Keyhaven um, a few years ago and they actually attempted breeding. Um, but the weather was a bit like it is at the moment. Um, and they attracted a lot of attention from some carrion crows and they didn't manage to carry on with their nesting. But uh, nice, nice occurrence. 
So a little bit more of Dan's artwork. Um, there's a sociable plover somewhere in there at the bottom of the picture. And uh, this was turned up in 1986. And it was a Titchfield Haven had an actual, uh, an amazing purple patch of rarities. Um, a, a sociable plover, a cataligrat, which was the first for Hampshire at the time, and a spotted sandpiper all turned up there and they were all available to see. And there's a photograph of the sociable plover. So Hampshire has actually got quite a history of, of, of attracting rare waders. It's not so, not so good for a big variety of rare passerines, but uh, we've got a good wader list. Um, and this one, I, I'd like to mention Andy Johnson, who is um, a birder who lives down on Hailing Island. Or he did. He's moved up to Shetland now. He wants to find more rarities. But um, one of his ambitions was to focus in on the ring plover roosts and listen out for the unusual call of the semi-palmated plover, which is an American species. And, you know, he'd been listening out for it and listening out for it, and he finally reckoned he'd heard one. And he tracked it down, and that, there's the photograph of it. You can see, see, it's a young bird, but it's a bit smaller than the, the ring plover. And again, it, hu it hung around for several days, and uh, everybody was able to enjoy it. And this is an even older picture, um, a kill deer, that was at Key Haven in 1980. Um, and uh, there hasn't been one since, so we're still waiting for the next one. And Lawrence Chapel from Christchurch, the, 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 the Christchurch birders, they occasionally come into Hampshire when they can't find anything in Christchurch, I think. But uh, he tell, you can read the story in the book. He came to, um, came to Keyhaven again and uh, was getting a bit fed up. Um, all he was seeing was dog walkers and so on. But uh, he had one last um, scan across the mud and found this creature in the middle of the ring plovers again. And it's, uh, it was a, a, a lesser sand plover, uh, although it's now called a Siberian sand plover. Um, and uh, again, first for Hampshire, it did hang around. Again, there it is, quite a really smart looking bird. So moving on swiftly, the, ter the rare terns, they're very difficult to catch up with in Hampshire because um, they're so mobile. Here's a gull-billed tern. I still haven't seen a gull-billed tern in Hampshire. I did manage to catch up with a Caspian tern a couple of years ago. There was a fa fantastic one at uh, Fish Lake Meadows, which is a great new reserve that's sprung up in Hampshire. It's, a, it's attracting a lot of rarities. Um, and um, another great Andy Johnson find... There's a load of sandwich turns there, but in the middle, there's one with a yellow beak. And that's an elegant turn, which is a, a species from the west coast of North America, which has turned up a few times in Britain, amazingly. Um, but the trouble with this one was it, it went off very quickly and then went and landed down in Pagham Harbour in Sussex, and it stayed there all the time. <laughs> so although we could go and see it, we couldn't get it on our Hampshire lists. I think only about five people saw that bird in, in Hampshire. Uh, and this is, a, this is a whiskered tern. This is the one that was off Hill Head about three years ago. And I just mentioned Fish Lake Meadows. There was one there last year, wasn't there, that was uh, very photogenic as well. So here is a bird that is becoming more frequent in Britain. This is a young pallid harrier. Um, this turned up at Needs Ore. Needs Ore is an interesting place. I'm going to say a few words about it here because uh, it's a private nature reserve and you have to have a permit to go there. And, of course, the twitchers get very angry when things get suppressed. But um, what we prefer to do is allow news to drip feed out and uh, people get to see it. And I think that bird was there for about 10 days and a lot of Hampshire observers got to see it. It's feeding on a carcass of a Canada goose most of the time. <laughs> this is another bird that was at Needs Or. This is a blue-cheeked bee-eater. And um, this was found by two of the voluntary wardens, Alan and Caroline Dawson. And 
they knew it was a beta, but they didn't know, they didn't realise it wasn't the regular European beta. Um, and I know they phoned Dave Unsworth once they realised what it was, um, but of course, by the time anybody else got to come and look at it, it had disappeared. But the evidence is there. A couple of shrikes to show you. This is a brown shrike that was found by Bob Marchant down at uh, War's Ash. And some pictures of um, the uh, Dorian shrike that was found by John Norton at uh, Gosport in a recreation ground. And there's a whole history here of birds that I've missed because I was on holiday. And this is one of them. <laughs> I was probably off in Peru or somewhere like that, you know, looking at some things. But uh, here's another picture of it. Uh-huh. Slipped in this picture of um, a nutcracker. As you can see, it's a pretty grotty old picture. Uh, it's from 1968 when there was an amazing invasion of nutcrackers into the UK. There was something like 350 turned up in the UK. So this is um, a picture. And apparently this bird survived for quite a few months into 1969 until it was unfortunately caught by a cat. Yeah. <laughs> So I was telling you about Dan having a fantastic year in 2000. Um, this, the, here are some sketches from the 1st of October 2000. I can remember the date. And he was part of the ringing team at, at uh, Titchfield Haven. Uh, and they'd caught a Paddyfield warbler early in that day, which is the only one for Hampshire. They'd had a Richard's Pippet fly over. And then they were out on the seafront and uh, watching a massive migration of... Um, Hirondines going over, and Dan picked up this one with this funny coloured rump, and of course it's an American cliff swallow. Um, and so they had a pretty fantastic day there. There's some more of his artwork. And the ringing team at Titchfield Haven have caught a lot of incredible birds, really. This is a palace's grasshopper warbler that they caught a few years after. I think there's only been one other in southern England, which was at Portland, um, it's really a bird you have to go to Shetland to see, basically. Um, but uh, unfortunately, with these birds that ringers catch, their little skulking things, as soon as they let them go, they just disappear and nobody else gets to see them. But that's the way it goes. But uh, it's on the record. Here's another one I was... Oh, I was, I was somewhere nice. I was actually in the South Pacific um, visiting Henderson Island, uh, which is one of the... Uh, the UK overseas territories. But this is an eastern olivaceous warbler that turned up at Farlington Marshes. Again, was there for several days. And the red flank blue tail at Hailing Island, found by Andy Johnson. Um, this is a bird that's got much commoner in Britain in recent years, but we've still only had the one in Hampshire, um, and I was away on holiday. But uh, <laughs> it's becoming a recurring theme, isn't it? There we are. So out of interest, how many of you saw this bird? Oh, this is not as many as I expected. Okay, yeah. Probably about 20 owning up to seeing it. Yeah, how many people saw the Eastern Olivaceous Warbler? Yeah, it's a few more. Yeah, a bit more recently. You're gripping me off, as they say. <laughs> Do you want to take over the talk, Keith? Um... Here's an iceberg that I did get to see, which was the, um, uh, an eastern black-eared wheat ear that was found in um, the New Forest in 2015, I think it was, and it stayed there for the day. And the most interesting thing about this, which I found out when I was doing a research for the book, there were photographs of this bird, and it had a sort of bit of a deformity in its tail, and sur photographs surfaced from the Netherlands of a bird that was photographed about four days before had exactly the same deformity and it was obviously the same, the same individual. And it was, just, it was seen for one day in the Netherlands and it was seen for one day in the New Forest. So goodness knows where it was in between. Um, so here we have the Spanish sparrow that uh, was um, in a garden in Cowshot. I think one of the nice things about this story is um, here's an example of where people were a little bit reluctant at first to 
let the news out because it was in somebody's garden, but then they were able to make arrangements and lots of people were able to come and see it and lots of money was raised and, and collected for conservation uh, and local community groups as well. So that was a, a good story. I suppose it could have come off a ship, but who knows? Anyway, they still count. And I'm, I'm actually going to finish um, after the Alpine Act Centre. This was, uh, this was an, quite an amazing record about five years ago, found by a guy called George Else, who was looking at um, solitary bees nesting in the, um, in the cliff there at Brunwich, down near Titchfield Haven. And this bird hopped into view. He photographed it, didn't know what it was identified it at home, Alpine Act Centre, disappeared, of course, straight away. A few others turned up in Britain around that time. And then finally, I was, I was talking about birds that may have come off ships. We've got a couple here, um, the dark-eyed junco that was in the New Forest at Hawk Hill Enclosure, and uh, it stayed for several weeks. Again, this was identified by a non-birder, I think got in touch with you, wasn't it, Keith? And we got the identity sorted out. And it, people put seed out for it, I think, and it, it sort of stayed in, in the same area. And uh, finally, the white-throated sparrow from uh, Old Winchester Hill that actually was around there for about, altogether, for about, about three years. So there's a very quick run through my book. Um, or That, where, sorry? Did somebody say? Sorry, uh, Anyway, a very quick run through my book. Um, I do hope that uh, you'll come and have a chat with me and Dan in the second hall and uh, consider buying a copy. Uh, all the profits are going towards HOS, so again, they're in a very good course. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>